Greenblatt, and um, he was here last year, those of you who were here last year, and played with his partner, Ted Dykstra. They had a fabulous thing, huge successful show called Two Pianos, Four Hands, and it's about living with the piano, so we had the two here, and, uh, and they thrilled us. Um, and so you might ask, why, why is he back? <laughs> and, and the truth is, I'm very conscious, we're very conscious, that you come here for new ideas, uh, new horizons. So uh, we're very careful about those who we invite back. And if we do invite someone back, it's because they're still doing something interesting or because the story needs the next chapter somehow, and that next chapter is irresistible. And what made it irresistible for me is that I learned last year that Richard was preparing a one-man show based on the work of Tom Lehrer. Tom Lehrer is the great satirist uh, who flourished during my college days, uh, wrote some spectacularly interesting songs, and then one day just stopped. I was hoping you would tell me why. All Richard right. Greenblatt. Uh, well, I can't tell you why in such a short amount of time. Uh, but if you come and see the show, <laughs> you'll find out, or at least why I think, or what he says. The show is called, by the way, Letters from Lair. And uh, when I started to have this idea, I, like Moses, I uh, grew up listening to Tom Lair. Uh, I think I was first introduced to him uh, by the time I was about eight years old. And um, uh, became... Um, obsessed, I guess, or a fan, as my parents were. So I started working on this material. I did, uh, you know, extensive research, and I wrote him. Uh, he's still alive. He's 77 years old. He spends half the year in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and half the year in uh, Santa Cruz, California. And uh, I wrote him, and he said, well, there's no show there. Uh, he said, um, and I told him I was interested in, uh, in doing a show about why he quit, and what were the reasons that he did. And he said, I just got bored. I didn't have any ideas. So not being one to take that as an answer, I kept writing him, and he kept saying, there's nothing here, there's nothing here, there's nothing here. So finally, I started working on it, uh, thanks to the play development program at the Canadian Stage Company. And uh, I realized, in fact, he was absolutely right. <laughs> Drama, the cliche goes, is about conflict. He had no conflict about giving up. He just was bored. He, he was telling the truth. He was bored and he, did, he stopped getting ideas. And there's other things there too, which again, you'd have to see the show to, to get, which includes my theories as well as kind of throwing some quotes back in his face. Uh, but in fact, I realized the conflict of the drama was mine, not his. And it's my feelings of his abandonment of us when we needed him the most. Uh, where was the voice of, of dissent? Where was the comedic voice of dissent? I actually had wanted to talk at one point about what is truth. Um, uh, a lot of my work that I do is, uh, I don't even bother changing the characters' names. I just play the part of Richard Greenblatt. I don't even care to, to try and invent stuff. Um, the question that Ted and I got asked more often than not in the over 750 times we performed Two Pianos, Four Hands around the world, and it was true anywhere that we performed it was, is this play autobiographical? Now, of course, arguably, any piece of art is autobiographical. Does that give it more validity? Like we see in Hollywood movies, for instance, that the spin doctors will put in big, broad letters based on a true story whether it's Cinderella Man, or my favorite actually is The Lords of Dogtown, which is based on the incredible true story, which I guess means, I don't quite know what, that also seems like a contradiction in terms. <laughs> but how uh, does it give more validity? And we find that uh, as a society, and maybe it's human nature, I don't know, and certainly this culture and this mass media culture, we have this fascination with truth, whatever that may mean. Now it's true that my work, uh, I, I guess I'm, kind of obsessed with my own life. And, uh, and so I feel that there's enough, there's enough material there for, to last me my whole life. <laughs> and, uh, but of course what we're looking at is something which is a different kind of truth. It's not just who my brother was and what my parents said and did and uh, how old was I when I was first introduced to Tom. But what I'm looking for, I guess, is a kind of a specificity. 
and clearly I'm the expert on my own life and really nobody else's. But what I can do is to try and communicate the specificity of my circumstances and hopefully if I do it honestly enough as well as craftily enough, manipulate the story, get as far away from truth uh, as I need to go in order to communicate the story, then hopefully there's a possibility, a chance that it will co connect to each one of you in your own specific situations, which may not be mine. So, I'm going to read a section from the play, and uh, I, apolo I shouldn't be doing this, no performer should ever apologize, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, I'm going to read it because I haven't had a chance to memorize it yet, and also I'll be playing a couple of songs, and I feel uh, woefully ill-prepared to perform them, but I'll do it anyway. So, this is the moment of first contact, when I am first introduced. It's Sunday morning in the suburbs. I am sitting cross-legged on the wall-to-wall -wall carpet in the living room of our split-level home. There's a stereo console in the corner, minimalistically designed in Scandinavian teak, with the speakers built in, shelves for the record, records, and a turntable which slides out from its center. My father is unwrapping the plastic of a new LP. Now, normally, Sundays are reserved for classical music, a Beethoven symphony, the Bach Brandenburg Concerti, or the new Isaac Stern. Classical music is highly valued in our home, being considered the height of humanity's achievement. My brother plays the violin, I the piano. But this Sunday is different. My father hands me the album cover. There's a drawing on it of a demon, horns, a pitchfork on the floor, black glasses, a long tail, wearing a tuxedo and a skewed keyboard which stretches off to infinity. And there are flames that lick at the borders on the cover of all four sides. It feels wicked. So, I'm sitting on the wall to wall listening to this devil, and I watch my parents giggling, or occasionally guffawing heartily. They share him lovingly, like they do their inside jokes or Yiddish aphorisms. I don't get some of it. From the Bible to the popular song, uh, there's one theme that we find right along. Uh, of all ideals they hail as good, uh, the most sublime is motherhood. There was a man, though, who it seems once carried this ideal to its dreams. He loved his mother and she loved him. Uh, and yet his story is rather grim. Uh, was a man named Oedipus Max. You may have heard about his odd complex. You'll find his name in Freud's index because he loved his mother. His rivals used to say quite a bit that as a monarch he was most unfit, but still in all they had to admit that he loved his mother. Yes, he loved his mother like no other. His daughter was his sister and his son was his brother. Uh, one thing on which you can depend is he sure knew who a boy's best friend is. When he found what he had done, he tore his eyes out one by one. A tragic again to a loyal son who loved his mother. Uh, so be sweet and kind to mother now and then, have a chat. Buy her candies or some flowers or a brand new hat. But maybe you had better let it go at that. Or you may find yourself with a rather complex complex. You may end up like Oedipus. I'd rather marry a duck-billed platypus than end up like old Oedipus Rex. Uh, what's a complex? I ask. They patiently try to explain, wanting me to share their enjoyment. I either understand their explanations and laugh somewhat compliantly, or I still don't. Certainly any sexual innuendo flies over my eight-year-old head. These are euphemistically interpreted with the assurance that I will understand someday soon. Why does he miss the spacious back seat of his roommate's beat-up Chevrolet? But I love poisoning pigeons in the park. I understand it all. It's funny, silly, outrageous, perfect for my prepubescent sense of humor. I feel grown up listening to it and getting it and laughing at it. I am hooked. This Devil's Album is a family thing. All four of us can connect concurrently to it. A rare thing. It's the early 1960s. Kennedy is president, the Berlin Wall is going up, the Bay of Pigs fiasco has occurred, and Vietnam is still just a police action. J.D. Salinger publishes his last book and disappears. My parents have left the Communist Party, or CP, or just the party by then. They left in 1956, 
after the 20th International when Khrushchev revealed Stalin's crimes. They left like betrayed lovers, feeling duped by being lied to all those years, feeling jilted, unappreciated, unloved, and deeply, deeply hurt. And Tom's humor is a kind of antidote, perhaps, to all that rhetoric and dogma that they've had to hold up as good comrades for over 20 years. My father used to say that there were only two forces in the world, progressive and reactionary. But now, I guess my parents may have discovered the sudden appearance of political gray zones and a need to find potential allies where they could, even in musical satire. And the world is holding its collective breath during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Tom's brilliant song, We Will All Go Together When We Go, from that second album, suddenly becomes extremely real, altogether plausible, almost inevitable, and a lot less funny. I am scared to death. When you attend a funeral, it is sad to think that sooner or later, those you love will do the same for you. And although it might be tragic, not to mention other adjectives, to think of all the grieving they will do, oh, don't you worry. No more ashes, no more black cloth, sackcloth, excuse me, or an arm brand made of black cloth will one day evermore adorn a sleeve. For if a bomb that drops on you gets your friends and neighbors too. There'll be nobody left behind to grieve and we will all go together when we go. What a comforting fact that is to know. Universal bereavement and inspiring achievement. Yes, we all go together when we go. We will all go together when we go. All suffused with an incandescent glow. No one will have the endurance to collect on his insurance. Lloyds of London will be loaded when we go. We will all fry together when we fry. We'll be French fried potatoes by and by. Yes, there'll be no more misery when the world is our rotisserie. Yes, we all will fry together when we fry. Down by the old maelstrom. There'll be a storm before the calm, and we will all bake together when we bake. There'll be nobody present at the wake with complete participation in that grand incineration. Nearly three billion hunks of well-done steak. We will all char together when we char, uh, and let there be no moaning at the bar. Uh, just sing out a to diem when you see that ICBM and the party will become as you are. We will all burn together when we burn. There'll be no need to stand and wait your turn. When it's time for the fallout and St. Peter calls us all out, we'll just drop our agendas and adjourn. Uh, you will all go directly to your respective Valhalla's. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, uh, and we will all go together when we go. Every hot and tot and every Eskimo, when the air becomes Uranus, we will all go simultaneous, yes, we all will go together when we all go together. Yes, we all will go together when we go. Richard.